2 Kings chapter 5, starting with verse 4. The word of God says this, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from, the, from Israel had said. Remember that message from last week? By all means go, the king of, of Ram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent his text message saying, Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to just to delve into your word and to unpack this wonderful message of revelation. We look forward to all the applications for our lives, for our church, as we move forward. Open our hearts and our minds that we may see. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. amen. Wow. So you know that there's been a dispute of sorts between the Arameans and Israel. We know that they had been bullying Israel for some time. Remember, the little girl was taken captive, and she was forced to serve Naaman's wife. And this is an opportunity for kind of smoothing out those relationships of sorts, right? An opportunity, a gesture where Israel can say, sure, sure, let's, let's find a peaceful way, an amicable way of handling our strife. But the Bible says as soon as the king receives this request, he sees it as a fight. You wanted to start a quarrel with me. Now, Peter, I don't know about you, but what would you do if someone came to you and said, I have an issue, I have a problem, and I heard that your God answers prayers? What would you do? This is an opportunity for us to be employed in the service of the Lord and say, back up, watch what I can do. I remember back in the day, uh, this, was, this was 19... 98. Michael Jordan was in his last year with the Chicago Bulls, and everyone wanted to make sure they, they caught him for one more time. I was not going to miss seeing him live. I was a college student. My Aunt Greta secured some tickets for my brother Greg and I to go see the game, and we did. It was in the Bay Area. We were students at Pacific Union College, and we went on an evening to see Michael Jordan. And I'll never forget walking into the stadium. And, and seeing the Chicago Bulls in their red warm-ups, you know, in the layup line, and I saw the bald head. It was just glistening. And from the top of the rafters, I was like, I love you, MJ! It was so exciting just to be in the same room of sorts with the greatest of all time, the GOAT. And just imagine with me, if Michael Jordan heard my voice and looked up in the rafters and said, Jonathan, come hither. Would you like to sit on the bench with me? Do you think I would turn him down? Absolutely not. I would scamper down those steps. I would get as close as I could to him. I would grab a towel and say, Michael Jordan, I will be the greatest towel waver of all time. And I would just be cheering him on. But let's just say the game was getting a little tense and Mike looked down the bench and realized his teammates weren't enough. And he said to Phil Jackson, Phil Jackson, sub Jonathan in. <laughs> me? You want me to come into the game and, and play with you? You want me to pass the ball to you and shoot? Okay, I'll just pass. Do you think I would turn him down? 
the opportunity to play with MJ would be an opportunity many people who enjoy basketball would never turn down. And yet so many times in ministry, God invites us, who I call the real MJ, Michael Jesus, gives us an opportunity to work alongside of him, and we see it as something beneath us. That's, that's what people who like read the Bible do. We have opportunities every day to be employed in the service of God. And it doesn't have to be some official ministry in the church. We have opportunities for grace where we can show kindness. We saw that in our story, our story uh, this morning with the children. Opportunities to show kindness even in the face of turmoil, even in the face of someone not being kind to us. These are opportunities where God is saying, I want you to play alongside of me. I want you and need you on my team. And the king of Israel, the king of God's people, turns him down. In fact, he considered it fighting words. Am I God that can decide life or death? This man is clearly going to die. You ain't going to put his death on me. Tore his robes, sends Naaman and his millions of dollars out the door. But of course, Elisha, He's always going to want to play with MJ. He says, send him to my house, and I will show you that there is a prophet in Israel. Let me tell you something, fam. You don't have to be a prophet to be on God's team. Every morning we wake up, we have an opportunity, an opportunity to be a part of the fountain of grace. Every single morning. It starts sometimes with some of you with your spouse, your children. It starts when we're on the freeway and someone cuts us off without using a blinker. We have an opportunity that when we drive up next to them, you know how it is when you make a mistake and that car drives up right next to you and you don't want to look at them. For the first time you have both hands on the wheel and you're looking straight. But we get to drive up next to them and, and, and when we lift our hand, all five fingers are there, we're waving. I get it, we make mistakes, have a great morning. We have an opportunity, and we need to take advantage of it, amen? Bible says in verse 9 and 10, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, his servant, Gehazi, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. That seemed pretty simple, right? But it's interesting that Naaman doesn't have a very positive reaction to what he's told to do in order to secure his restoration. The Bible says, in the very next verse, but Naaman went away angry. He went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. I'm sorry, you're about to die. You go to your enemies and beg for mercy. They oblige you and give you what their recommendation is. They give you the prescription that will cure you of your ailment. And you are upset because they're not chewable Flintstone vitamins. Have you ever been like that with God? Asked him to come through for you? You have a specific prayer request? He answers, but you don't like the color? You don't like the dimensions? You don't like the timing? You don't like the order of events? And Naaman, remember, he, he's Naaman the Great. Remember, we talked about it last week. He was great because he was a warrior. He was used to people respecting him. And so he's a little 
put off by this seemingly lack of respect, he's going to send his servant to tell me these things? I thought the man of God would come out himself. Honor me. Give me what I deserve. Doesn't he know what I could do to his house and him? Wave his hand. Anoint me. But no. And then he tells me to wash in the Jordan River. And just so you know, the Jordan River was not one of those rivers anybody wanted to bathe in. You couldn't drink from the Jordan River. You didn't swim in the Jordan River. Animals went there to die. And he's like, I'm not about to wash in these rivers when there's far better rivers for me to cleanse myself. But then something happens that I find a little bit interesting. Let's go down to verse 13. Verse 13. The Bible says that Naaman's servant went to him and said, <clears throat> My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Oh man, this is a good verse I want to unpack here. If he had asked you to do something great, like climb Mount Everest barefoot, crawl on your knees backwards all the way back to our hometown, would you not have done it if he asked you to do something that you believed was, was worthy of your greatness so that you, Naaman, could say, in order to be healed, I did this and I did that, and look at how much money I gave them. Wouldn't you have done it if he asked you to do something great? But what he asked you to do is something simple. You got to read between the lines here. He asked you to wash your dirty, decaying skin in dirty water. Simple, in order to be healed. This is a reality that many of us have never embraced. Do you know that the, the, the things that God asks us to do in order to be restored, the things that God asks us to do in order to experience all of the blessings of being a part of his family, do you know those things are actually really simple? The things that God requires of us are actually easy. I'm going to say this again, and it's not going to hit you the right way, but that's okay. Christianity is easy. Serving God is easy. You want to fight me, huh? No, pastor, we must bear our cross, deny ourselves. You're right, we do have to bear a cross, but can I tell you something? Even Satanists have to bear a cross. Oh, oh, you thought because they worshipped the enemy that he was nicer to them? Oh, you're so cute. You thought that sin plays favorites? That if you were to live in debauchery, the enemy would leave you alone and cancer would never be at your doorstep? You mean if you were to sell your soul to Satan himself? that you wouldn't get preferential treatment moving forward? Let me tell you something. Even people that deny the existence of God go through depression, have stress, have anxiety, have cancer in their family history. If you're a human being and you have stepped foot into planet Earth, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have problems and let me say, you're going to have crosses. The difference is the cross of Christ. You already heard how I qualified that, right? The cross of Christ is something you never have to bear alone. You will have your storms and you will face your giants and you will have your walls of Jericho. But when you're with God, oh man, Goliath comes off like a three-foot child, right? Right? The walls of Jericho are like a five-foot high chain-link fence that you can easily catapult yourself over. The fiery furnace, if you're not careful, will feel like a sauna. And even though there are stormy waters, you get to walk on top of them. You will have your cross to bear, but Jesus says, 
follow me, for I have conquered the world. And he's going to make us more than conquerors. Being a follower of Christ doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. It means that you're going to be able to bear those problems. You'll get through those problems. And in the end, you'll almost be thankful for the problems. Something about those problems will have taught you something. This is why Jesus says, I'm going to say it again, Christianity is easy. This is why Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. What is Jesus' yoke? What does the Bible refer to his yoke as? His teachings. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. Those are his words. Those ain't my words. Don't, don't take it up with me. He's going to tell you in the end, it's easy. No, no. I would rather work seven days straight. I don't think we need a weekend. We don't need a day of rest. I would rather continue to live in deception. I want to continue to lie to my friends and the people closest to me because I love life when I'm lying, trying to remember all my lies and nobody trusts me. Sin is hard work. Anybody want to testify about how much drama? And I've had some people tell me, listen, I've had people, I know people that have several relationships going on and none of their partners know about the other and that person is stressed out, cannot sleep. I had one young man come to me one time when I was pastoring in Oakland. He says, Pastor, I don't see what the problem is. We should be able to be with whoever we want to be with and how many people we want to be with. Look at David. Look at David in the Bible. I'm like, yo, look at David. Look at David in the Bible. You see a stress-free life there? Look. All of the problems were because people were trying to go outside of God's very simple and easy plan. Sarah, honey, why don't you just be with my maidservant, Hagar? We'll make all things new, right? We are still dealing with their problems because they came up with a very easy way out. Come on. The 12 tribes of Israel come from drama and petty competition. I bet you I can have more sons than you. Oh, yeah? Honey, be with my servant girl. Oh, yeah, honey, be with my servant girl. I'll show you. Well, I'll show you 12 tribes drama. God's way will always be simple. What makes it complicated is our way of viewing it. Whatever God asks us to do is always going to be in our best interest. Whatever God asks us to do is always going to be for our good. Whatever God calls us to do will always be the easier path than the world. Don't for a second think, don't for a second think, because you may get a high quicker doing it the world's way that somehow it's easier. No, it's not. What the world is looking for is happiness. They'll settle for the high, but what they're looking for is happiness. What God offers you is happiness. And if you trust him, you'll get that. You'll get the peace that passes all understanding. You'll get the joy that is overflowing. You just got to trust. Do the simple thing. So the servant says, man, just wash, bro. And so Damon's like, don't you ever talk to me like that, but you're making sense. <laughs> so he goes up to the Jordan River and listen, children, li listen, children, this, this is how I imagine. This is how Pastor Henderson imagines it, right? I imagine him going up to the water and he's like me. He's probably afraid of cold water, right? You don't want to be in cold water, but I imagine him going up to the water and looking at it, and it being kind of muddy and murky and everything like that, right? The water in that picture, it's a little greenish. And like, but I, I don't think it was even that clear. So he looks in there and goes, washing that? Come on, sir, you can do it. You can do it. Think about the healing. You'll be restored. You'll be naming the great again. Your family will want to be around you. Okay. All right, all right, I'll do it. Um, this is how I imagine it, kids. Um... Oh, it's cold. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll do it. <clears throat> Are we going to do a countdown? Yes, sir. We'll do it on three. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> just cannonball it. Okay. One, two. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Are we doing it on three or is there a three and then a pause and then we jump in? Sir, so we're going to do it on three. Okay. Three. Um, okay, wait. Listen, like I'm not going to jump in. I just, I'll just go in. I'll go in. And this is how I am. I'm, this, I'm at any beach unless... It's tropical, warm waters. I am this way all the time. I go in just a little bit, just a little bit of, 
Oh, why, Lord? Why did you create cold water? Um, okay. He goes in, one foot, adjusts to the temperature, starts to go in a little bit more. Oh, my goodness, right? Go in a little bit more. Oh, somebody touched my leg. Somebody touched my leg. Somebody touched my leg. What is that? It's just a dead cow, sir. Just get back in there. <laughs> oh, oh. So he goes in. Oh, something touched my leg again. Sir, sir, think about it. Cured. You want to be cured? Go for it. Okay. He gets in halfway. Okay, I'm washed. I'm washed. No, 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 sir. You have leprosy everywhere. Top of your head. All the way in. <sighs> he starts to go in a little bit more. And then he dunks his head. <laughs> oh, something got in my mouth. Something got in my mouth. Sir, you did it. Six more times. I imagine Naaman looking at his skin, right? And there's no change, no discernible difference. Oh, it's not working. It's not working. See, I don't even know why God told me to do this. I'm just being humiliated. They're, they're, they got cameras on me. I, this is going to be all over social media. I see what's happening. Sir, six more times. Now, how many times did the Bible tell us? A lot of times when we're wanting to do it God's way, we'll encounter some kind of conflict because it's hard to change patterns. And we'll come up with all these reasons why we shouldn't continue. But if God says seven, and he tells us that seven will bring about the healing, we have to do it seven times. The best part of following Jesus is being consistent. You want to follow Jesus just on the Sabbath day? You want to follow Jesus just a weekend? You're not going to get the full benefits. So he's telling them, wash. And, and this is the beautiful part about it. Those of you know, as much as I don't like cold water, once I get in and my body gets used to it, it doesn't feel as cold, right? And so this is what's happening with, with, with Naaman. He's in there for a little bit while, and so now the smells aren't as strong. He start getting used to it. He's getting used to the dead animals, you know, floating down the river. He's getting used to all of it. And this is the beautiful part of following Jesus. That even though it may challenge our comfort zone, pull us away from what, what we're accustomed to doing, when we continue to practice what Jesus calls us to practice, it becomes easier. It becomes simpler. It becomes more enjoyable. We reset our palate. And God begins to open things up to us in a way that we had never seen and heard before. I'm going to tell you something right now. What God was offering Naaman in this moment was grace. Not just the grace of the outcome, but the grace for the experience itself. God knows that there is something to be gained in the process of working through our issues, becoming better men, becoming better women. And so God gives us something so that we can take part in our healing. Absolutely, Elisha could have simply said, waved his hand and been like, you're healed. But do you know that every miracle in Scripture, every single miracle in Scripture, requires some level of human effort? Every single one. Every single one. There's something like, hey, yeah, what do you have in your hand? All right, toss it. Uh, throw this into the water. Uh, put some flour in the pot. Every single miracle, God is doing something in partnership with man because he knows the blessing that comes from us being an active part in our healing. He knows the value that it will have. He knows how it, what it does for our mind and for our body, and this is the reason why God calls us to partner with him. Partnership with God is also grace. It's also grace. It's not him doing it all on his own. People always say this all the time. Jesus just does everything. You don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. Doing something is what makes it fun. Jesus did everything at Calvary. We didn't have anything to do with that. At least nothing good. But when it comes to us being sanctified, when it comes to us being faithful, when it comes to us being healed, Jesus is always partnering with us. So Naaman continues to partner. He continues to partner. Let's continue to read. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 5, 
verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Oh, can you imagine that seventh dip? I imagine he probably did some backstrokes. He stayed in there a little bit longer because he was feeling himself now, right? It wasn't so bad. You're right, this wasn't so bad. The Bible says that after washing himself seven times as the man of God had told him, his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Some versions say baby. Could you imagine that? Imagine Elisha coming out of that, those muddy waters and his servant saying, Sir, ooh, look at that skin. Ooh, what have you done? What is your secret? All these little muddy waters. Just listening to the prophet. Right? Skin like a baby. He went in there, I mean, with scars from battles and all these tattoos and everything. Just, I mean, he had drama on that skin. All the disease, all everything that it meant, the shame that went with it, the judgment, all of that. He washes seven times and comes out like he had never made a mistake in his life. As if nothing had ever gone wrong. He came out of the water like a born again person. Amen. Skin like a baby. Oh boy, he knocks on the door. Elisha, sir, open up. Oh, you little guy, you knew what you were doing. Open up. Elisha opens the door. Ooh, let me touch. Ooh, hoo -hoo. beautiful. The first time anything like this had ever happened. Yeah, in, in Exodus, Miriam, remember she went off on Moses and God said, mm, she had a little bit of leprous reaction to that experience and, and was healed almost immediately. But this had never happened really in all of Israel. Lepers all over the place. And the one, according to Jesus, the one of all the lepers in the nation, all the lepers in all the surrounding nations, the one that God chooses to heal is a mortal enemy of his people. So what does what is, what is Naaman want to do? The Bible says, he's really clear. The Bible says that, that Naaman and his attendants in verse 15 and 16 went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except where? So it, please accept the gift from your servant. All right, I received a gift from you. Now you receive a gift from your servant. And the prophet answered, thank you for your tithes and offering. God be with you. Is that what, the, what, what did Elisha say? My Bible tells me Elisha says, absolutely not. As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Family, why would Elisha not accept just an offering, tithes? He just, he wants to bless the man of God and his people. Why not accept it? It is his natural, organic reaction to being healed. No cost at all. You want to know why? Because God's gift is free. Amen. You ready for something else? Not only is it free, there are no strings attached to it. He heals Naaman and doesn't say, now you know if I heal you, you can never mess with my people again. And Naaman says, you're absolutely right, God. I will do that. I promise you. Now you know if I do this, you must do that. Uh, okay, yes, yes, Lord. He heals him without any prerequisite. No, now you, but pastor, he asked him to wash. Yes, because he knew the value of being able to participate in his restoration. Again, even that is a gift. And those of you who have known what it takes to be healed, those of you who know what it takes to, be, to overcome addiction, it is a blessing knowing the energy and effort that you put in in connection with God and his people, right? The, the, the buy-in is so important. So yes, even the buy-in part is a gift. And when Naaman was healed, when he was healed and he wanted to naturally bless God and his people, God says no. Because in order for the gift to be free, you cannot require a gift in return. This is why it's so important when people talk about grace. They, I've heard this all the time. Cheap grace. Cheap grace. People will say this often to me. Yes, pastor. Yes, yes. Salvation is free, but. Right? Remember we talked about that but last week? 
Naaman was a great man, but once you insert the word but, it cancels out what you said prior. Salvation is free, but there are things you have to do in order to receive it. There are things that you must do, uh, pastor, in order to hang on to that gift. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says that while we were his enemies, in Romans 5, that is when he died for us, while we were powerless, that he came through one righteous act and redeemed all of us, justified all of us. For God so loved the world, not you so loved God, for God so loved you in your mess, in your dysfunction, that he gave his only begotten son. Now you'll say, but pastor, but you have to have faith. You have to trust. Here's the thing. This is where the trust is. Trusting that it's yours. We've been studying this on Wednesday night for prayer meeting. I know not everybody's here and goes to prayer meeting. I guess you're all going to be lost. Because <laughs> you don't love Jesus enough. But we've been studying the book of Romans, and it's so powerful because Paul is trying to drive this point home. He's saying there is nothing you can do by keeping the law that will make you right with God. Only Jesus can make you right with God. Won't you have enough faith to believe that God loves you enough that there is nothing you can do to add to that love or take it away? That nothing will separate you from his love, not even life, not even death. That is so hard to believe. Yet Jesus says, believe it. But we've never experienced love like this. Not even the people who promise to love us till death do us part. They never mean it. Some people will stay in marriage because they're afraid of how people will see them if they don't stay in it. Very rarely are people staying in marriage because they love that person. And they would give their life for that person. Some will stay in marriage because it's convenient. Because they don't have, they don't have the means to survive without it. Some are just too lazy to leave. You're used to it now. But the kind of love that God offers us, it seems supernatural. But it's the love that he gives us and the love that he's trying to teach us to have for one another. And when we can love like that with no strings attached, we develop an environment that is so much healthier. And this is why it is so important when we're looking at Scripture to see love, not from what the Kardashians say, not from what social media says and all these pop psychologists but to know what love is by what the Word of God says. I love you with no strings attached. That means that even if you are not kind to me, I'm going to be kind to you. That even if you don't love me and like me, I'm still going to love you and like you. Even if you are not warm towards me, I'm going to be warm towards you. And I know what you're going to say, but pastor, that's, that's impossible. I know it's impossible if you're going to do it the way the world does it. But if you do it the way that God does it, if love is dependent on how you treat me. It's not even love. It's something else. It's transactional. And in this moment, it's not transactional. But watch what happens. Because it's not transactional, and because there's no strings attached, something beautiful happens. And we're going to close on this. The Bible says that in verse 17, if not, if you will not allow me to bless you with money, Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never make a burnt offering and sacrifice to any other god but the Lord. Oh, y'all didn't even catch that. This is so good. Watch, watch, watch. If he would have been allowed to pay for it, he would have paid for it and walked away like, I did my part, God did his part, I did my part, we good. Once he couldn't pay for it, something in him just boiled up to the surface and he says well if you're not going to let me pay for it can I at least worship your God forever can I can I be friends with him and have a relationship with him and that even when I have to go into the other God's temple with my master I know your God will understand that I'm not really there for those gods. I'm just, I'm just my job to be a servant. But he'll know my heart and allegiance is with him. Can I worship your God? Amen. And Elisha says, look, you can take as much as my front long as you want. Because worship is also free. Following God is free. Being forgiven by God is free. 
Being restored is free. Worship is free. Everything God gives us is free. And when we understand it, for the first time in our life, we can worship from a place of true authenticity. Oh, you mean I'm going to be saved just because he loves me? No, no, he's going to save me because he knows that deep down in my heart I'm really a good person and he knows I'll be good. And no, 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 no. He knows you deep down, deeper than you even know yourself. The filth, the deceit, all of it, and says, I love you. And I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Can you trust that? Can you just believe that? Because if you don't believe it, you'll always be looking over your shoulder on the new earth like, oh, it's about to pop off. No strings attached, family. No strings attached. Boop, 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 boop. No strings attached. Okay, I get it. I see, you're trying to, I see where you're trying to go. But no buts. No strings attached. Well, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, said that's not fair. He races down Naaman. And says, oh, 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 sir, sir, my, my master has changed his mind. We have some guests coming over, and we'll take some of the money you have. Naaman was so great. Oh, sure, sure. Here's a couple clothes. Here's some pocket change for them. Sure. And Gehazi goes back home feeling so proud of himself. That was right. It wasn't right for him to get away without paying anything. We could have used this money for our academy. Elisha meets Gehazi at the door and says, Hey, hey, where you been? Oh, no, nowhere. Just, just chilling. Just chilling. He says, was I not there in the spirit when I saw you have that conversation? The Bible says from that day forward, Gehazi ended up with what Naaman had. And Elisha said, the rest of your family from this point on will carry this. We have a lot of spiritual lepers in this church bunch of Gehazis that always want to say, but, 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 but nothing. Jesus loves you. He's going to save you. He's already forgiven you. Even the sins you are unaware of and you're going to commit in the future and you may not even be that sorry about, he's already forgiven you of those. Everything your heart desires is already yours by the grace of God. Do you believe that? I'm going to invite the praise team to come forward. If you have not accepted God's gift for what it is, today is your opportunity to accept. It does not mean you have to come to church tomorrow. It does not mean you have to come to church next Sabbath. It does not mean you need to be a member of this church. It does not mean you have to, to give your tithes and offerings. It doesn't mean you have to keep the seventh day Sabbath. God has given you a gift with no strings attached. How does that make you feel? Really, how does that make you feel? I know you're, you're upset, don't be mad at me. But pastor, this is cheap salvation. When you see Jesus face to face, I want you to grab his hands, put your finger in the nail marks, look him in the eyes and tell him it's cheap. It cost you nothing. It cost God everything. But you were worth it. We're going to sing a song that the choir sang to begin our worship experience. The first and last stanza of Come Thou Fount. But we're going to sing this song, church family because we've heard the gospel and we believe it today. If that is your prayer and your song, I'm asking you to stand to your feet as we sing this song.